Well, good morning. morning. Don't you appreciate Miss Melissa playing that piano as you're coming in? That's nice. Nice, nice. I hope everyone's having a good morning, or at least you're here. That's a good start to your morning. I'm glad you're here. We're going to sing a song in just a second. The choir's going to lead out, and we want you to help. But it goes like this. I will lift my hands up. I will raise my voice high. I will shout of your love until the day that I die. Everything that I have and all my worship I bring. You're the reason I live. You're the reason I sing. Won't you stand up? Let's do that together one time. All right, here we go. It's going to start with a verse and then you're going to sing a chorus. All right? Help me out, choir. There's a reason I can sing. There's a reason for this life inside me. One name above all names. What's that name? Jesus. Yes, it's Jesus. Just sing one more verse. Ready? There's a reason for this soul. There's a reason for this peace that I know. One worthy of all praise. Let's say his name. Jesus. Yes, it's Jesus. Come on, let's sing it now. Here we go. I will lift my hands up. I will raise.
Amen. Brother Charles, come amen, on with amen, us. Amen, amen, You may be seated. Be seated just for a moment. I want to welcome you here today. Uh, Labor Day. Can you believe it? Yes. We always... <laughs> she believes it. Uh, you know, I've always thought, kind of thought about this. It's just, well, it's just kind of the unofficial end of summer. And, of course, school is back and we're all happy that uh, uh, everybody's back in place and our routines are starting back again. But as I uh, went to sleep last night, I was thinking about this day and the holiday, and, and uh, I just began to thank God for, uh, you know, the, the, the whole reason for Labor Day is to celebrate a workforce in America. Uh, their, their accomplishments, the strength of our country and the prosperity that it brought, the well-being to our country. And I thought, you know what, why wouldn't we just pause today and give God thanks for our country where we can do that. We've just come through COVID. You know, there were so many people lost their jobs. There were so many people that didn't have an opportunity to work. Now there's jobs and not enough people, it seemed like, to fill those jobs. Uh, but there's an opportunity here for that to happen. That's not true in every part of the world. It's not true in every place in the United States. There's a lot of people that are looking for work and can't find it, and they need it desperately. But we have that privilege and that opportunity that God has given to us in this country. I love the United States of America. We, we celebrate that. We have a lot of problems, but I'll tell you this. I'd rather live in this country than any other country in the entire world. But God has blessed us here. Amen. And so I just think it would be appropriate today to pause in our service and give God thanks and praise that we have an economy that we have that we can work. I know we may be in recession. I know things are, I get all that. But listen, uh, we have the freedom here to do and to be and to accomplish. Amen? Amen? And that's a gift from God. That is a gift from Almighty God. Will you join me in prayer? Father, this morning as we bow in your presence, uh, Lord, I thank you for just allowing me to pause and celebrate in my own heart the goodness of God in this country that you've, you've allowed me to be born in and me to live here in all my entire life. Uh, my uh, father before me, my grandfather, Lord, uh, such a blessing uh, to be in a country that can celebrate the fact that uh, we have a labor force that's able to work, to uh, begin their own businesses, to prosper, to be uh, blessed by the by the hard work that they place in it. And you've given us that opportunity in this country, and we're grateful for it. We're thankful for uh, so many people that work so hard to accomplish so much so that we could enjoy what we enjoy in this country today. As a matter of fact, it's just sitting here uh, in this service with the cool air conditioners uh, blowing, with comfortable seats to set upon, with carpet to walk upon, uh, Lord, uh, what a blessing it is that we've been afforded these kind of luxuries in this country in which we live. And we, we don't want to take it for granted, Lord. We want to express to you our heart of appreciation and thanksgiving for all the benefits that you have allowed us to have and to enjoy. I pray, oh God, that we would not take these things for granted. Lord, we're, we've just been reminded over the last couple of years of how quickly all of this can disappear and go away, Lord. Uh, we just take it for granted that tomorrow is going to be like yesterday. But, Lord, that's not always true. I pray, O oh God, that we would live with our, our, our heart uh, thankful to you, Lord, with our mind focused on being the best that we can be in the place that you have placed us. And, Lord, uh, that we would realize that in this country we have been blessed so that we might be a blessing to the entire world. There's no country in the history of, of, of the world, literally, that has given more to the world in terms of uh, prosperity than this country. Even those that we fought in war against, Lord, we, we helped build their countries back. Father, let us not lose that spirit. Let us not lose that, that idea, Lord, that every life is valuable and we're here, Lord, so that we can be a blessing to others, not just to ourselves. Thank you, Lord, that we can celebrate a national holiday that recognizes and celebrates the ability to work, 
to earn a living, to start a business. Lord, to use our gifts and skills to the fullest of their potential. I ask you to bless this country, Lord, as we look forward to the future. Bless, Lord, uh, us as, as that we would take serious the gifts of God and we would not take things for granted, Lord, that we would look to heaven once again in this country and know that you are the source of our blessings. We, we work because you give us the health to work. Lord, we, we earn wages because you give us the ability, the mental capacity, the physical abilities to do those jobs. Lord, it's all a blessing from you. Let us remember that today and celebrate it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for praying with me about that. It's just been on my heart all morning. I am grateful for our country that we live in and the blessings that it has afforded to all of us that are in this room. Amen. Let me say, if you're a guest today, you are an answer to prayer. I, it's true. We pray every week for guests to join our, us. And uh, so if you are a guest, you're an answer to prayer. That's a big deal. Uh, thank you for being here. We want you to feel uh, welcome and at home that today you would just sense that this is your church today. Uh, there's guest cards in the pew somewhere near you. If you would allow us to have any of your contact information, we'd like to connect with you. We, we honor your information that you would give us. We would never intentionally abuse that. Uh, but we'd like to know something about you so we can connect with you, let you know about what the ministries here have and uh, how that we might be a blessing to you and how that you might be interested in something uh, that we're doing that you would like to join further in. After the service, Mike and Kim is going to be out in the foyer. And uh, we have a gift for you. If you take your guest card by there and just uh, give it to them, we're going to give you a gift from the church, just uh, an expression from our heart to you. Thank you for being here today. And we want you to have that, and so you'll remember this day of your visit. So, again, thank you for being here. Uh, I am grateful for our time of worship. Amen? Amen. And uh, we're going to continue right now in our praise time. Brother Mike, would you All help right, us? All right, thank you. Let's stand together. We're waiting for this day. We're gathered in your name. We're calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire. We'll burn our hearts with truth. For the reason we're here. You're the
Why would I worry when giants come calling my name? My God is so much bigger than troubles I face. Sing with me. today how many of us have a mountain that's in our way right now in your life some form of mountain I'll lift my hand do you have a mountain in your life that you don't think God can move today anybody 
You know what? He is greater than whatever you think that mountain is, right? Financial, relationship, whatever it is, God is bigger than that today. Amen? Maybe you can turn that over to him today as we continue to worship. I won't be shaken. I won't be moved. My God is faithful and his promise is true. I speak to My God is bigger, better, stronger, greater. He's bigger, better, stronger. One more. He is bigger, better, stronger, greater than you. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up, oh, until I lay my head, I will see. Of the goodness of God. Let's just hear them, everybody. Ready? All my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I What do we do? I will, I will sing, sing of the goodness. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire, darkest night. You are close like no of God, and there will be no more night, there'll be no more pain, no more 
tears, never crying again. And pray. There's a mansion that's prepared just for me Where I can live with my Savior eternally And there will be no No more pain No more tears Never crying goodness go minor of God I will see of the goodness of God amen God bless you thank you have a seat brother Charles is coming thank you choir thank you players The Bible says that God inhabits the praise of his people. I sense the manifested presence of the Lord when we praise him at Central Baptist. Thank you for all of you who has a part in leading that. I just stood there and turned and listened to you sing. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Thank you so much. Open your Bibles to John chapter 8, if you will might hold that place in the Old Testament, a minor prophet called Habakkuk. You may look there. We're going to look at a couple passages of Scripture today. Um, following the uh, study in the book of Jonah, I was going right into uh, the messages, a couple messages about hearing the voice of God. Twice in the book of Jonah, God said, uh, the Bible says that God spoke to Jonah. You were in that study, or you studied your Bible, you know, of course, that uh, the most important thing in Jonah's life uh, that is that he was able to hear from God. Absolutely the most important thing in his life. And so I would say to you that uh, that's the most important thing in our life, is our ability to hear from God. More important than our education, more important than your career, more than uh, uh, important than your financial security, more important than your religion, is the ability uh, that we can hear from God, because God does speak 
to us. The Bible is replete with stories of God speaking. As a matter of fact, uh, he's speaking to all of us. Even now, God is speaking to us, and uh, the Bible is full of it. But God is not the only one speaking. The Bible says uh, that Satan is a prince in power of the air. And uh, I believe that he's getting his message across. I think uh, it's my uh, humble but accurate opinion <laughs> that the prince of power of the air is that, that uh, Satan is uh, using social media, television, radio. Uh, that message is bombarding us continually, and it's a message of untruth. It's a message of lies. It's a mas- message uh, of demonic uh, information that is filling our world and as a consequence of that, our, our culture uh, is listening more and more, I think, to the voice of Satan, not the voice of God. And so it's important that you and I be able to hear from God. And as I said, the Bible is filled with illustrations of God speaking to people. So God has uh, uh, still speaking. I mean, if, if the Bible is full of stories where God is speaking to people, uh, is God still speaking today? And I believe the answer to that is yes. Uh, why aren't I hearing God then? If God is speaking, and that's true, Pastor, uh, why am I not hearing? Well, I think it's because we're not tuned in. Uh, if you had a radio receiver, you could turn it in, and while I'm speaking, you could listen to, uh, well, you have your iPhone. You probably, some of you may be doing that. I don't know what I'm, uh, what I'm speaking. Uh, but you got to be tuned in, and we have to be tuned in to the Lord. In John's Gospel, In chapter 8, Jesus is speaking to religious leaders. They're in a a dialogue about Abraham and about who he is, the Lord Jesus Christ, who he is, and and about Abraham. And uh, Jesus is is talking about Abraham's seed and Satan's seed. Uh, They're two different things. There's two different groups of people. There There are those who are God's people, and there are those who are not God's people. So whose people would they be? They would be Uh, Satan's people, right? You're either one or the other. It's not a combination of both. And Jesus is saying to them that, uh, uh, I spoke to you. Let's just read beginning at verse 37. I know that you're Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word, listen to this, my word has no place in you. Why were they uh, upset at Jesus? Well, because uh, the words of Jesus, what he was speaking, they did not want to hear. And that's not uncommon. That's always been true. King Ahab uh, listened to 150 prophets about what he should do. And they all were telling him what he wanted to hear. And so uh, somebody said, is there another prophet? And and, uh, Ahab said, there is another prophet, but I hate him. (laughs) Why did he hate him? Because he told him what God wanted him to hear. And people uh, have often, most of the time, I would think, uh, in in the world history, doesn't want to hear from God. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did not uh, do this. You... The deeds of your, you do the deeds of your, of your father. And they said to him, we, we are not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Nor have I come on myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Here it is again. I've got Jesus, I'm speaking to you, but you're not hearing because you're, you're not able to listen to my word. Verse 44. You are of your father the devil. And the desires of your heart you want to do. He is a murderer from the beginning. And does not stand in the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he speaks. Listen to this. When he speaks it's a what? It's a lie. He speaks of his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? The question. And if I tell you the truth, why do you not believe me? Another question. And then here is the statement, verse 47. 
He who is of God hears God's word. Now that's a New Testament uh, truth. Jesus is speaking to him. And uh, he says, I, God is speaking, but you're not hearing me. Every morning uh, when I am in my prayer time, I try to reference Moses. He was in dialogue with God, like few in the Old Testament, certainly. And uh, the Bible says that God showed up in his life, and uh, he listened to him. We're going to reference Moses in just a moment. But the Bible says of Moses in the book of Psalms that God showed his acts to the children of Israel, but he showed his way to Moses. And so Moses found, uh, prayed, uh, God, if I found grace in your sight, show me your way that I might know you. I want to hear you, Moses said. I, I, I want to know you in your fullness. God continually spoke to others. He spoke to a young child by the name of Samuel. Remember that? When he was just a child. And Samuel cried out, speak, your servant is listening, God. He spoke through his prophets. He spoke uh, to his disciples in the New Testament. Jesus said in the, in the book of John, my sheep know my voice. And so I want to talk today about how do I hear from God? If God is speaking and Satan is speaking, they're both speaking in this world. How do I, how do I discern the difference between the two voices that are going on in this world? And uh, that's the first point. Why is it important to hear and distinguish the voice of God? Hear and distinguish the voice of God. Well, several reasons. Number one, as I just read in John chapter 8, verse 47, it proves that you're a child of God. Uh, as I said, we, he was talking to religious leaders. He said, why don't you understand my speech? The answer is because you don't listen to my word. You are of your father the devil and the desires of your father you want to do. That's why. You don't want to hear what you don't want to hear. You're like Ahab in the Old Testament. All these people telling you what you want to hear. And my, my, can I just say to you, there's always going to be people that tell you what you want to hear in this world. That they'll, they'll, they'll tell you whatever you want to hear uh, because they don't care about you. They don't love you. God tells you the truth. Why does he do that? Because he does care about you. He does love you. Whoever hears my voice, uh, John said, uh, or Jesus said in the book of John, you are my disciples. Number two, it protects you from mistakes. Uh, some of you talk about the length of the outline today, and you're kind of worried that there's an intercession, uh, an intermission in it. There's not. Uh, but I will tell you, I attempted to go to Job 33 and share some of Job 33. You ought to read that passage. In Job 33, clearly, it says that a hearing God's voice will keep me from making mistakes in my own life. Number three, uh, it's the key to a productive life. Every successful accomplishment in my life has been because of God's grace and me being able to distinguish when God was speaking to me about certain things in my life. Nothing is more important than to be able to say, uh, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. So uh, that being true, point number two, hearing God's voice uh, doesn't begin with your ear, it begins with your heart. And this is the heart of the message today. If you're going to hear from God, it's, it's not a, an issue of the ear before it's, first of all, an issue of the heart. God wants to speak to you, but you have to be tuned in to what God is saying. It's not just hearing, it has something to do with the heart. And so uh, I would just say this, you must surrender your will to do God's will. You must surrender your will to do God's will. Uh, you, you, uh, we want to say, Lord, speak to me, and I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> Isn't that right? Uh, Lord, speak to me, and I'll try to uh, entertain what you said, and I'll get back to whether or not I'm really interested in doing what you want me to do. Uh, it should be, Lord, the answer is yes. Now you tell me what you want me to hear, and I'm going to do it. I'm going to say uh, up yes. Uh, the, the answer is yes. I'm going to sign the check. You fill in the blank, God, uh, because I want your will to be done in my life. I want you to be exalted in my life. I want to please the Father, uh, as Jesus was saying to the religious leaders. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm of the Father. Listen to me. Uh, I want to please him. Maybe the best illustration in the Old Testament is, is uh, the book of, of uh, Exodus when 
uh, God called to uh, Moses. And you remember the story in Exodus chapter 3 where he came uh, out in the desert, in the uh, back side of the desert, and there was a bush that was on fire, but it wasn't being consumed. And uh, he walked up, and uh, the voice of God said, Remove your shoes where you're standing as holy ground. And God begins to communicate with him. And you know the story of uh, Moses, alias Charleston Heston, <laughs> uh, how that uh, uh, he had spent uh, three segments of his life, each segment 40 years. He had spent 40 years of his life in the King Palace in Egypt, learning that he was somebody. And then the Lord took him to the backside of the desert where he became a shepherd and had to learn that really he was nobody. Uh, and then God was able to use him as a servant leader for the rest of his life. A servant leader that was in dialogue, talking to God and hearing God speak back to him. Now, don't you want to be like that? Don't you want to be in your life a person that can discern the, the voice of God as he speaks to you? Well, uh, it, he, he said, well, okay, I'm hearing your voice and you want me to go to Egypt, but how are they going to know, God, that I heard from you. I mean, Moses was a very brilliant person. And he knew that there were other voices that were going to be out there. He said, I can go and tell them, God, that, I, that you spoke to me and that I've heard you. And that I'm to be the uh, deliverer of the children of Israel out of the bondage of Egypt. I can say that. But, but how are they going to know? And, and God says, we got to do something about your surrender of your heart. And so uh, God asked him a question. And he asked him this question. He, he says, uh, what is it that you have in your hand? And uh, in Exodus chapter 4, he said, I, I, have a, I have a shepherd's staff. That's what I have in my hand. And God says, throw it on the ground. And he threw the staff on the ground. And what happened to the staff? It became a what? A, a snake. And then God said, pick it up again. I would have had to have been sure God was speaking <laughs> to me at this point. Uh, and, he, and he picked it up again. And what happened uh, to the staff? It went right back uh, to being a staff. Can I say to you that the most important question that God is going to ask you is, what have you done with my one and only son, Jesus Christ? I think the second most important question that God is ever going to ask you is, uh, what did you do with the one and only life that I gave you to live? What did you do with that? Did you squander it away? Did you live for my glory? But I think the third important question is the issue of a, uh, that demonstrates a, a heart that is surrendered to him. Uh, what have you done with what I've given you to do with? Because can I tell you this? When God speaks to us, I believe the majority of the time, it's because he wants us involved in his kingdom plan. He wants us involved in the work that he has for us to do. Uh, he, he's not just talking to us to carry on a conversation with us in some way, but he, he's expecting some results from us. And so uh, Moses did not think he had much in his hand. And I, I, I have to uh, tell you that I can relate to Moses a little bit when I look at my life and I go, well, God... You know, I'm, I'm, I'm no big deal. I don't know how you could, if, if you spoke to me and, I, and you want me to, I don't know how you could use me. That's always been true in my life. You know, uh, I, I've heard people who said, you know, I ran from the call of God's, you know, uh, being called into the ministry and, or to be a missionary. I, I ran from it. I fought it off. I, I, it was not true in my life. I just never believed I was good enough to do it. And, and so... At a very young age, I, 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 I knew I heard from God that I was supposed to be in ministry, but I just didn't think I had anything to offer God. I mean, there were so many other people that had so much other stuff going on in their life. But I want to tell you, when I read this story, I find that, that, that God said, you know, what you have in your hand is all you need in your hand because I'm going to use what you have in your hand. In Rick Warren's uh, book, he talks about uh, that the staff that uh, Moses had in his hand represented three things. His identity, his income, and his influence. Uh, his identity, it represented who he was. Who was Moses at this time in his life? He was a shepherd. You know, interesting, isn't it, that 
uh, almost, well, not almost all, but a lot of vocations have a symbol that represents them. You see somebody wearing a white coat and a stethoscope around their neck, you, you assume they're in the medical field, right? I mean, uh, they're just, they're just uh, uh, symbols. Well, that's a symbol. It represented uh, in Moses' day, certainly, that he was a shepherd. And uh, that staff was a symbol. And uh, uh, the income. Uh, back in those days, uh, wealth was determined by how many animals that you had in your herd. As a matter of fact, Solomon said, the wisest man who ever lived in the book of Proverbs, uh, know well the condition of your flocks. I think if it's written in modern day language, it said, know well the condition of your stocks. <laughs> you know. Uh, we, we're at a different time, but, but there are things that represent our, our uh, if you had a lot of sheep, you were wealthy. If you had a few sheep, you were just uh, moderate. If you had no sheep, you were poor. <laughs> and it represented his influence. <clears throat> what was the shepherd's staff used for? The shepherd's staff was used to direct the flock, uh, to uh, influence where they're going to go, how they're going to go. Uh, that's what it was about. So I agree with uh, what, what Rick said in his book. It's very inspiring to me to read that. Uh, but God was saying to Moses, and I believe to us, uh, if you are willing to lay down your identity, your income, and your influence and give them to me, I will make them come alive. Now, that's better than that. You all didn't respond. God was saying to Moses, listen, if you're willing to lay down the thing that represents you, then I'm willing to make that thing come alive and be a blessing. As a matter of fact, it'll be a tool that I use to uh, lead the people of Israel out of bondage. And it was. It was the symbol, wasn't it? It was Moses' symbol. It became his symbol. As a matter of fact, from this day forward, it was never re referred to as a staff, it was always referred to as the rod of God. Read it for yourself. And here's what God's saying, if, if, if you will listen to me and you'll surrender your heart so that I can direct your life, if you'll put your, your influence, your, your identity, if you'll uh, put your income in my hands, then I will make it come alive. But if you pick it up again, It'll just be a, a piece of dead wood. It, it has no power apart from the power that I'm putting into it. And, and Moses picked it up and he surrendered his heart to, to do what God said. It wasn't going to be easy for him to do it. Can you imagine going back uh, before Pharaoh and, and saying, let my people go? Or even to the people, of, you know, he wasn't even welcome to the Hebrew people. They, they basically go, who, in the, who do you, why are you here? Uh, it, it was hard for him. But God, he heard from God, and he acted upon it, and he surrendered himself to it. Now, why is that so important? Because God wants you to hear and obey him so he can use you. Why would God speak to you? To give you direction so that he can use your life. So if, if, if that's true, then what are some of the prerequisites that I need to have in my life? What, I don't have a shepherd's staff. I mean, well, I have one. Uh, Bobby and Mary gave me one, uh, but it's, it's a keepsake. It's not for use. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't have that. That's not what I have. So when I lay down what God has given me, what are, what are some of the prerequisites that I need to have if I'm going to hear the voice of God? Number one, you must believe God cares about every detail of your life. Every detail of your life. And he does. How many of you know God cares about every detail of your life? He does. He cares about every, every area of your life. As a matter of fact, I, I don't know why this always strikes me as so powerful. The Bible says that he knows how many hair upon your head and they're numbered. And that's a big deal for all of us, but maybe not as big a deal for some of us. <laughs> And God knows this morning that hair number 4,731 went down the sink. <laughs> he knows that. You, you see, God cares about every area of your life. The Bible says that God is love. It doesn't say he has love. The Bible says that God is love. 
You and I are the crowning of his creation. And we are loved because God is love. As a matter of fact, God's love for you and me is not based on our conduct. It's based on God's character. That is worth an amen right there. Because that's good news, isn't it? God's love for you and me is not based upon your conduct. If it was, how many of us would be a timeout today? But you know what? Even when the parent puts the child in timeout, they still love the child, right? Listen, there is chastisement from the Lord that comes upon us, but it's only done because He loves us. He cares about everything in our life. God's love means He pays attention to us. He's a, he pays attention to every detail of our life. There's not anything that's going on in my life that God doesn't know about and God doesn't care about. Think about that just for a moment. And so when I'm willing to listen to God, doesn't it make sense? If he knows me perfectly, he knows what I need better than I know what I need. I've always said if, if our kids would have uh, listened to us, they would have known out of our love we would never have required anything of them that wouldn't be but good things. And when we speak to them, it's, it's out of a, a voice of love. And concern and care. And that's how it is with God. And so many times we're not willing to tune God in. Because we think that God doesn't care about us. God's not concerned about us. But God is. And if you're really going to hear from God. It starts with a heart that's surrendered. And understanding this. God loves you and you matter. When God gives us his attention. And he does give us his attention. Do you know what that means? When, when I, when I uh, give you my attention, I'm really giving you myself, isn't, isn't that right? When, when I'm paying attention to you, I, I, I sit down, I, I look you in the face, I, I look you in the eye, and I listen, and I speak to you. Uh, I'm giving you myself. It's the most important thing that I can give to you is my attention. God says, you have my undivided attention. Number two, you must believe that God wants to clear up your confusion about life. Are you confused about life? Well, I am. There's so many things about life I don't understand. I, 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 don't, I don't understand uh, a, a lot of things. I don't understand why uh, things happen in this life the way they happen. I don't understand Alzheimer's. I, I, I mean, I don't understand that. I don't understand how some people live a great life and they're clear-minded. And right up into the very moment they die and, you know, they go to sleep and they go to heaven and... Uh, and, and other people are not able to understand even, as far as we know, where they are. I don't understand that. But here's what I do understand. That no matter what the condition I'm in, God loves me completely and totally. And that God wants to speak to me to clear up confusion about my life. Well, you know that. Well, in James chapter 1, verse 6, the Bible says, If you need wisdom, ask our generous God. This is out of the New Living Translation. If you need wisdom, ask your generous God, and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. But when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver. For the person who has divided loyalties is unsettled as a wave in the sea and blown about and tossed with every wind. God is not trying to hide his will from you. He's not trying to hide his will from me. Uh, uh, James said, uh, Jesus said, you do not have because you do not ask. Oh, excuse me, James said that. You do not have because you do not ask. Jesus said, seek, knock, and you will find it. It will be open to you. You can come to me. You can talk to me. Most of the time uh, when we're uh, coming before God and we're trying to get discernment about issues, it's more like this. Why? <laughs> That's most of the time. But can I tell you the why question is usually not the question that's looking for information. It's the question that's looking for an argument with God. And so God doesn't explain himself to us, but he does direct us with his will. And by the way, an explanation wouldn't make you feel much better anyway. Uh, God said, I'm not going to give you an explanation. I'm going to give you my presence in your life. And so the key to asking God is to be specific in your questions. Just don't throw out the why question to God. Be specific about them. Uh, and a great help from us uh, about being specific is the next passage I told you we were going to look at in your Old Testament. Uh, turn to the book of Habakkuk, one of the minor prophets in the back of the Bible. 
And here's what I love about Habakkuk. In chapter 1, Habakkuk, he doesn't understand things. I mean, he, he just doesn't get it. And I can relate to that. <laughs> and, and so in chapter 1, he is very specific, asking God specific questions about uh, not why, but why this and why that and why this. Specifically, he wants to get some answers from God. And then chapter 2, God answers him specifically. And so uh, I, I think that uh, it's important that, that we, if, you, if, you wanna, if you're confused about life, then you need to be asking God about specific things in your life. Don't just throw out the why question because that's not really a question. That's a pity party. That's looking for an argument or a debate. And God's not going to argue with you. And he's going to, not going to debate with you about anything. And so God speaks in specific ways in chapter 2. So are, are you there? I'm not there. Let me get there. <laughs> uh, maybe I'm not going to get there. Yes, here it is. And in chapter 2... Uh, God begins to answer specifically uh, the questions that Habakkuk has asked. And here is Habakkuk's response, chapter 2, verse 1. And uh, uh, in, in the New King James it says, I will stand my watch, I will set myself on the rampart. I will watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer him when I am corrected. Then the Lord began to uh, give him a vision. So there was, there was Habakkuk's part. There was a specific question. And God begins to give him the vision. Now the New Living Translation. Let me read it to you again. This is chapter 2 verses 1 through 3. I will climb up on my watchtower. And I'll stand at my guard post. There I will wait and see what the Lord says. And how he will answer my complaint. Then the Lord said to me. Write the answer plainly on tablets. So that a runner can carry the correct messages to others. The vision is for the future. It describes the end. It will be, and it will be fulfilled. If it seems slow coming, wait patiently. For it will surely take place and it will not be delayed. So here, here are the steps that I, I see in Habakkuk about uh, specific questions and uh, what to do with, those, with hearing the voice of God. Number one, notice this. He said, withdraw to a quiet place alone. Withdraw. You know, Jesus often withdrew to a quiet and a lonely place. Can I tell you that one reason that you may not be hearing God's voice is because you're too busy to listen. Because God wants to speak to you. You need to get alone, as Jesus gives us the example. Uh, noise keeps our mind from focusing. Let me give you an illustration. If you're older, you're going to agree with this. So you're, you're driving in a neighborhood, and you're looking for an address. And you say something like this, turn the radio down. <laughs> it's true, right? Turn the, why, why do you say turn the radio down? Because noise keeps our focus from what, what it's supposed to be on. Isn't that right? Can I tell you, you're not going to hear from God if you've got your ear pods in. And you've got uh, music cranking or you're, you're listening to, to something else. Uh, he, he says, number one, you just need to get away to a quiet place. Withdraw to a quiet place. Because... Uh, uh, we, we need to uh, listen for God. We, I, I need to remove distractions that are in my life. Because there's always a hundred voices calling out to you. Satan don't want you to hear from God. How many of you would say amen to that? Satan doesn't want you to hear God's voice. And so you, you get drowned in this pool of noise. The Bible says that Jesus often often retired to a lonely place or to a quiet place, uh, indicates it was a habit uh, which was part of his routine. Silence is scary, but it's necessary. 
just try this. Try to sit in silence. Okay, it's already weird to me. <laughs> it is scary. But God says to the prophet, if you want to hear my voice, if you want to hear me, withdraw. Get to a quiet place. We don't take time. We're in a 40-day uh, season of prayer and fasting in our church. And can I tell you, one of the secrets of, of, of this prayer time is to retire to a lonely place and get away from the distractions. So that you not only talk to God, but you are able to hear the voice of God. And then wait. Notice he said wait. Um, he said, I will station myself. I will station myself. I was uh, uh, New uh, Living Translation. I will stand at my guard post, uh, the King, New King James. I will stand watch. I will set myself on the rampart. Uh, he stationed himself. It is a time of, of waiting. I, I'm not going to hurry this. Because hurry is the death to prayer. It's the death of hearing God. We commonly uh, uh, are so busy that we don't settle down to even uh, be silent and listen for God. Uh, and, and yet... Uh, we can't hear from God if we're, if, we're, if we're busy going five different directions at the same time. And I know that because that's, that's what I'm always doing. If I'm doing this in my mind, I'm already thinking, okay, step three is this and step four is this. And I'm already, I'm, I mean, if I'm going somewhere, i got a route already in my mind. I'm going to connect all the dots and get around. Uh, listen, we got to calm down. He said, I'm going to station myself and I'm just going to be still. How bad do you really want to hear God speak to you? You have to have time for God to speak to you. You have to make time. You have to tune him in. David said, be still and know that I am God. Psalms 46. In Psalms 62, David says, my soul waits in silence for God. And till you get comfortable with silence, you're never going to hear the voice of God. And so he said, number one, withdraw. Number two, he says, wait, spend some time being silent. And number three, read the word of God. Notice what it says. I will look and see what the Lord said. I would think if it said, I will listen and see. But that's not what it says, is it? It doesn't say, I will listen and see. He said, I will look and see. The Bible helps us to understand this. Listen to me. The primary way that God is going to speak to you and going to speak to me is how? Through his written word. Through his written word. We need to uh, stop looking or listening for a voice and start looking for a verse. Because God's got a word from his word to your heart when you get in the word of God. That's why I tell everybody it's so important. You need to read the word of God every day of your life. You say, well, I don't know how in the world you have time for that. I don't know how you have time not to. If you really want to hear from God, and there's so, many, there's so many ways to do that now. You can have it on your phone. You can turn your phone on and listen to the Word of God when you're going to work. Uh, there are uh, great devotions. It takes a scripture and just pours out, out that scripture. There are so many ways, no matter how busy you are, that you can listen to the Word of God. You can hear God speaks to me as I read His Word. And then He gives me a mental picture of what He's saying. I read the Word of God, and it gives me an impression in my mind. And then it becomes a mental picture in my mind's eye. You know what I'm talking about when I say that, in my mind's eye. I get a mental picture of what God is saying to me. I start uh, meditating on it and thinking about it. And all of a sudden, uh, the image starts becoming more clear and more clear and more clear. And I understand, I, God, I believe that's what you're saying. I believe this is what you're saying uh, to me at this time about this situation. And then the third, th fourth thing is, uh, he says, uh, write it down. Write down the insights that, uh, of God's impressions upon you. Can I just go back to the other point again about what I discern from God? When I'm really meditating on Scripture, I'm trying to hear the voice of God about an issue in my life. Here's what I find more than anything else is encouragement from God. 
here's why I think I, here's why I say that. Because I grew up in, in the environment in the church that felt like if God is going to say something to you, it is to peel your hide about something. Oh, God so convicted me about this. God, boy, God really convicted me. God does convict us about things. But when, when I'm really listening to God, I find more words of encouragement. And you know why I think that is? Is because I am so mean to me. I, I just always think the worst of me. Do you have that problem in your life? I just, I struggle with that in my life. And so God is continually saying to me, you're weird, but I love you, dude. Amen. <laughs> you're <laughs> Double amen, right, Craig? <laughs> I, I love you. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. I made you just like I wanted you to be made. So I can use you in a unique way. That you are only you can do what I want you to do at this time here. Don't think that the only thing God wants to say to you is something hateful or some sort of correction. What God wants to say to you more, I think, than anything else is, I love you and you matter to me. And you're my child. And you're never not going to be my child. And I'm glad you're my child. And I love you with an everlasting love. Write down the insights that God impresses you. I, I had my prayer book. It's, I was going to bring it in here to show you it's thick now. Not because you would say, oh my gosh, he's got a thick prayer book. But I forgot it, so I guess God didn't tell me to bring it in here. But I, went, I just write down, I write down impressions. Here's what I know. I feel like God spoke to me and I think, oh man, I'm going to remember that forever. And then two days later I'm going, oh, what was it exactly? Write down the impressions that you think God has given to you. That's important. My shortest pencil is longer than my greatest memory. And so I, I was going through my prayer book this morning and, and just looking at things I've written down, scriptures I wrote down. You know, I figure if, if David can write prayers, I can write prayers. And so I have prayers in my, that I pray to God. I go back and I, I reread those prayers. Because I know that God is speaking to me and I'm responding back to him. And I'm saying, thank you, God, for showing me this in my life. I pray David's prayers. I, I pray Paul's prayers. I pray Daniel's prayers. Listen, I have those recorded. I have them written down. Because I know that it's God impressing and speaking to me. So I write those things down. And I try to meditate on them. Because I'm, I, I need to go back and review because once you get an impression of God, then later it's good to go back and review it. It's kind of like Paulette and I figured out communication in marriage. We, we need to be sure we understand what each other mean by what we said. <laughs> Some of you understand that thought. Because what you say, you don't always understand what you meant by what you said. You said the right thing, or you said the thing I wanted to hear, but... Now I'm thinking back, is that what you really meant by what you said, right? And so I go back and I review those things. I think you ought to do that. And that's what he said to the prophet. He said, write it down. So it can, it can be for review. Now, God and Satan are both always speaking. Would you agree with that? So how do you know... When the impression you get in your mind is from the Holy Spirit. And how do you know when the impression is from Satan? Because uh, the Bible says, for example, the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin and righteousness and of judgment. Is that right? That is right. But the Bible says that Satan is a condemner. He's a condemner. He is an accuser, the Bible says, of the brethren. So here are five or six things. Number one, when you think you have an impression from God, you have it written down, ask this, is it consistent with Scripture? 
God will never say something to you in your quiet time that will contradict what he has already said in Scripture. It's never going to happen. And so ask yourself, is it consistent? The Bible says the word of God abides forever. So number one, is it consistent? Number two, will it make you or make me more like Christ? The Bible says this in 2 Corinthians 10. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So if I think God is speaking to me and he's saying this. Number one, is it consistent with his word of God? And number two, is it going to make me more like Christ? If God is... And I've heard, believe me, in my years, so many things. But if what you think God is saying for you to do is not going to make you more like him, that's not the voice of God. You know, I think I'm going to uh, marry this person. And uh, we're going to move where they don't have any church and we're just going to forget. No, that's not God. That's not God. It has to be consistent with forming you in the image of Christ. Do mature believers in your life bless and confirm it? Paul said to the church at Ephesus, chapter 3, verse 10, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by, to the church, to the uh, principalities and powers in heavenly places. He said, I'm going to use the church to help confirm what my will is in my word. If you're reading scripture and you feel like God has said something to you and it contradicts scripture, or you say, well, I'm not sure if that contradicts, uh, uh, contra uh, I lost my word. What you said. Scripture. But I'm, I'm not sure, you, you, you go to other mature believers and say, what do you think about this? And if they go, well, I, I'm confirmed, I think this is where you should go, okay, fine. But if they say, well, I, 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 there's a check in my spirit about this thing. You just need to be careful. When in doubt, I just say don't. Listen, the church, mature believers are important to have around you because they help you discern what you, what you understand and think it is. If you get an interpretation that nobody in Christianity has ever gotten, it's not true. If it's new, it's not true. Truth is truth. People rediscover truth, but people don't come up with truth. And so uh, if, it's, if it's true, it's not new. The church family is crucial because you can always find somebody to tell you something that you want to hear. But mature believers are going to tell you what you need to hear. And here's another thing. Is it consistent with your God-given shape? Uh, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2.10. For we are his workmanship created in Jesus Christ for good works. Which God prepared beforehand for those who should walk in him. Is it consistent with the way God made you? If I were to pray and I would get the idea that God is calling me. Uh, to be a minister of music. <laughs> okay, how, you don't have to say amen to this, but how many think that wouldn't fit my shape? It just uh, that's not how I'm made, right? It, it's just not. And so, whatever God is going to tell you is going to complement. God is not going to make you one way to use you in some different way. Does that make sense? So God is going to do that. Here's the, the last thing uh, I would just say is, uh, do you have God's peace about it? The Holy Spirit draws you peacefully. Uh, the peace of God keeps our hearts and minds, the Bible says. God is not the author of confusion. The Bible tells us to let the peace of God rule in your heart. The, the Holy Spirit leads us Satan, in his voice, uh, is harsh to us. What is gentle, what's harsh? Listen, uh, 
the conviction and condemnation are two different things. Condemnation is of the, uh, of the devil. Conviction is of the Holy Spirit. Conviction is of the Holy Spirit. You sinned. Go tell God you're sorry. Get up in your father's lap, lap and let him love you. Condemnation is from Satan that says, you sinned. Get out of the sight of God. You don't even deserve to walk into a church. Who, who, how could you have done that? Does that make sense? We're going to continue next week on the subject of hearing the voice of God. But this is foundational if I'm going to hear it. Because hearing the voice of God doesn't start with my ear. It starts with what? Heart. My heart. Let me ask you, is your heart surrendered to God? It's important. Mike's going to come. I want you to stand with me. Is your heart surrendered to God? You say, well, Pastor, um, truthfully, I've never really uh, gave that a lot of thought. I, I'm not sure. Well, why wouldn't you want to be sure about it? Well, wouldn't you want somebody to take the word of God and explain to you what it means to give yourself to God completely? Have you surrendered yourself to God? You say, well, I'm, I'm a Christian, but I'm struggling in my walk. Well, you don't have to re live in struggle. You can come and live in peace. Amen? That's why John said, if we've sinned, we confess our sin and forsake it. And he'll forgive us and cleanse us from our unrighteousness. Don't live with an unsurrendered heart. Father, right now, Lord, we give this time to you. We ask you to have your way today in Jesus' name. Respond. Let us respond to you, to your voice, in Jesus' name. Speak to my heart, Lord Jesus. Speak that my soul may Brother Mike, let me ask you as we close today to remember uh, the Texas Country Boys. They're in a concert uh, in Temple tonight. And uh, they've gotten their schedule for the Ukraine now. And it's a lot more events than they thought. So uh, they are, the expense is greater. And they're, they do these concerts. Church gives. They use every dime of that to finance their trip this year to the Poland in Poland, but they're still reaching out to Ukrainians who are uh, there. God has been doing a great work, but pray for them, uh, that God would keep them safe as they travel, and they'll get them back to us safely, and uh, God would use them in a great way this, this, this year when they're on the mission field. That's important. Uh, the Bible says this, when uh, God was speaking to the priestly tribe of Levite, he said to Moses, when Aaron and his sons Gather the people together. I want you to use them to bless Israel. He said, say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. One of the things that God wants to say to you today is live in peace. No peace with God. And live in the peace of God. God bless you. Thank you for joining us online today. We are so glad that you were a part of the service. 
If you have any questions about what it means to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, about baptism, or how to join our family at Central Baptist Church, we would love to answer your questions. You can use Facebook Messenger to send us a message, or you can call or email the church. You will find our phone and email information on our website. Thank you again for worshiping with us today, and may God bless you and give you peace.